picking up, picking up from yesterday, uh, we, we were talking about, about machine intelligence. Today I'd like to talk about humans and, and what's, what's going to be happening with us, um, since I like to think of myself as a humanist, and I'm sure most of us in the room are. So um, let's begin with, with the effect on employment. And this is, this is something that um, has been in the press a lot lately. Uh, if, you, if you Google that, uh, jobs at risk of being replaced by robots, this has become a little bit of a, of a meme in especially the past few months, although um, you know, it's been around for a long time. Uh, you find lots and lots of news articles, um, you know, mobile robots and smart computers trying to replace up to half of the US workforce within the next decade, according to Bloomberg. And, um, you know, that of course everybody's very interested in exactly which jobs the, the robots are going to replace. Is it my job or, or is it the neighbor that I hate, you know, or who knows? Um, so, you know, so there's been, there's been a lot of sort of uh, armchair, um, armchair sort of non-empirical thinking about which, which particular jobs are going to be replaced. But what, what's, really, what's really interesting about this is, you know, on, on the one hand, it's not new. Uh, you know, this is, this is not just about machine intelligence. It's, it's really the whole story of technology. I mean, if we, if we think about Stacker Lee and steam shovels and, and things like this, you know, there's a mythology of, of um, devices, of machines of one kind or another replacing human labor over time. And that story goes back as far back as technology does. I mean, if you, if you read about what indigenous societies were like in Jared Diamond's books, for example, you, know, you find out quickly that upward of 90% of people in, uh, in a pre-agricultural society spend all of their time gathering food. And, uh, and now, of course, you, know, you have uh, farmers uh, you know, in, say, the American Midwest, where, where some of the largest scale agriculture is practiced, uh, you know, essentially with, with robotic irrigation and harvesting systems around them. You know, one farmer and family you know, able to cultivate an incredibly large field, uh, maybe not the best way of cultivating. It's a monoculture and it has all kinds of issues. But, but the, the leverage that's been afforded by all of that technology means that everything has changed with respect to the division of labor in the society. And all of those people who used to be hunters and gatherers and farmers and so on are, um, are now doing other things. So there's at least one narrative in which uh, menial labor becomes increasingly replaced by mechanization, by technology, by automation, and, um, and then people sort of move up. They, they move up and do more interesting things. They move up and do things that are more fulfilling or that are less backbreaking. And, um, and I think that that narrative is, has, has historically been largely true, and, um, and it'll continue. I mean, we, you know, we, we know, for example, that, that nowadays a lot of the um, sort of uh, very, very repetitive labor uh, that is required to assemble our, our devices in our pockets, you know, being done in, in Foxconn in, in China. Uh, you know, there's, there was this kind of widespread assumption, I think, on the part of many people that that's done by little tiny robots already. But of course, it's, it's not. It's done by, by people. Uh, but it probably won't be done by people anymore, even, even in a handful of years. And maybe that's good. Uh, you know, that's, that's not necessarily the kind of labor that, that it ennobles people to be doing. Uh, although, of course, it also has enabled a lot of, a lot of Chinese to move out of, uh, out of poverty in the countryside. So I think one has to look at that from, from both sides. So my, my, old, um, my old friend and colleague, Jared, Jaron Lanier has, uh, you know, wrote, wrote this book recently, Who Owns the Future, in which he argues that, um, uh, well, he, he argues essentially that, that all of this machine intelligence stuff is sort of, um, is sort of bunk, and, um, and really a lot of it is about repurposing the labor of, of, um, of humans. And the, the example, the, the, the Google Translate example that I just gave is a perfect one, and he, he actually uses this. So he says, there will always be humans, lots of them, who provide the data that makes the networked realization of any technology better and cheaper. So, uh, so his thesis is that we can, we can keep businesses going, business as usual going, we can keep capitalism and that whole system, um, provided that we attribute value correctly to the people who are creating that value. So you know, everybody who creates those parallel versions of a text 
on the internet that are then mined by Google Translate and then become a, a service that people use when they, when they use Google Translate. Well, if you just had people paying for Google Translate and those micropayments filtered back to the people who wrote the original text, then maybe everything would work and the middle class would be saved. I don't think that this is true. Um, and one of, the th one of the reasons that I don't think this is true, aside from the fact that the arithmetic doesn't work out, is that as machines become intelligent, we're, we're no longer talking about, about just uh, data mining and uh, you know, all of the value in these things accruing back to, to training data that, that came from people. I mean, of course, experience in the world, whether that's reading uh, people's blog posts and using that to translate or whatever is important, I mean, any, any intelligence needs to experience the world and learn from it, but there's value being created in that, in that experiencing and in that development of intelligence. I mean, otherwise, you could apply the same argument to, to us and say, you know, nothing that we do is of any value because, uh, you know, it, it all goes back to something that we experienced earlier in our lives. And that's the difference between intelligence and non-intelligence. Anyway, so tech means increasing capability at decreasing cost. More and more things are free or very, very cheap very accessible to a lot of people. Uh, you don't have to uh, you know, pay the orchestra when, uh, you know, when, you, when you listen to you know, a piece of music on Spotify. Um, so uh, you know, in some sense, we're all becoming gods. But um, are the vast majority of us becoming broke gods? Right? I mean, on the one hand, lots of free stuff, lots of incredible superpowers. On the other hand, the rate of elimination of jobs is increasing so rapidly that you know, if, this, if this continues, you know, one eventually gets to the point where there, there are not that many people who are employed in the sense that we understand that today. And, um, you know, and then maybe everything is free, but you know, not everything is going to be free, right? You're still going to have to eat. And you know, there's small matters of shelter and uh, you know, other basics, so you, you may be able to you know, to use, the, to use the free internet at the library or something, but you're, you're still going to be homeless. Um, so I think that we have a problem. And I think the problem really is, is a religious problem, and it boils down to this guy, to Calvin. Um, this, this idea that, that has really sort of percolated through the West for, for many, many centuries, that um, the amount of wealth that you have is a reflection of your value as a person, and that value that you have as a person is a reflection of your hard work and your labor and your industry. Um, you know, this is, this is an increasingly problematic assertion as you, uh, as you start to have an environment in which there are fewer and fewer people who are employable. There are already cities in the United States where 70% of the population is on disability uh, because when, when all of the jobs are jobs that, you know, that, that involve sort of the heavy manual labor and uh, you know, the, the, kinds of, uh, the kinds of mild conditions that are not a big deal if you're a desk worker become, make you unemployable in that environment. You don't have the skills. You know, what, what, do, you, what do you do? And, and we, see, we see that as, um, we see those people at some level as, as undeserving and, uh, and so they should, they should starve. Or we see providing for such people as charity, which is a very patronizing attitude. And that's not going to stand when, uh, when we start to see the jobs of, um, of doctors and lawyers and other traditionally sort of higher status people also replaced by, by these kinds of intelligences. And I think that's going to really be a moment of reckoning for us. So um, the solution, I, you know, I, I think is, is very, very obvious and very simple. Uh, the, the experiments have already been done to, to start to, to play with these kinds of solutions. I would have put more... More, more data about this into the slides, but, but some of you kept me up way too late last night. So <laughs> <laughs> didn't get a chance to put in the relevant slides. But the Mincom experiments in Canada in, uh, in, the, in the 70s uh, were experiments in redistribution of, of money. And basically, it was a very simple idea. It was just give everybody money. Uh, you know, take, take a certain amount of money and redistribute it in a more or less uniform way to everybody. This has been experimented with in various forms, either as a negative income tax or, uh, or just as a, as a flat redistribution. And, uh, and it works. It works pretty well. Um, and uh, you know, there, there are countries uh, in Scandinavia that, that are you know, experimenting with this or thinking about experimenting with this now. And um, I, think that, I think that we're going to see 
an increasing amount of that. And I think in some sense it's really the only, the only solution, especially since we, we still have a, a sort of population bulge that we're going to be experiencing over the course of this century before, before human populations start to decline to more sustainable rates. And if we, if we don't have a, a population that, that's satisfied at a basic level, that has food, has housing, has the basics, then I don't know where things go. I mean, that, that seems like it, it implies uh, you know, a complete meltdown of, of, of the social structure or revolution. Um, so, you know, we, we've been seeing the, the signs of that, um, of, of that jobless recovery and that movement of capital from the, um, uh, from the middle class into, uh, into the, the very rich all over the world for the past 20 years. So again, it's not just machine intelligence, it's the general acceleration of technology. Um, these are changes in the Gini coefficient, which is a, a measure of economic inequality in a bunch of the OECD countries, um, averaged over, over 20 years or so. And you can see that you know, in very unequal, very inegalitarian societies like Mexico, they've become even more inegal uh, inegalitarian since 1985. They've become even more unequal. But in, in very uh, egalitarian societies like Finland and Sweden, the, the economic inequality has risen even more. So, Economic inequality is rising everywhere in the world, uh, except in, in this case Turkey and Greece, which had their own, their own issues during this period. But um, it's rising everywhere because of that effect of, of technology increasingly um, making a lot of goods and services, on the one hand much cheaper and much more available to everybody, but on the other hand uh, eliminating the jobs in the process. So, lots of rise in inequality. Now, I, I'll, I'm going to shift into, the, into the, other th the other theme of the talk, which is really about gender. Let's, let's, look at the, um, let's look at that through another lens. So this is changes in, um, in income, uh, averaged over the course of about 20 years in nine of the OECD countries, uh, broken down by decile of, uh, of amount of income. So P10 is a little hard to read. It's OECD data. The P10 is the lowest 10% of earners in a country, and P90 is the highest 10% of earners in a country. And uh, the height of the bar is the, is the annualized change in income, corrected for, for inflation and stuff. And um, there are two features that you should be seeing. One of them is that most of these, almost all of these, have, have a positive slope. So in other words, the right-hand side is higher than the left-hand side. And that's a marker of that increasing inequality. Right? So uh, the rich have gotten richer, and the poor have not gotten as much richer, or in the case of the US, the poor have actually gotten poorer, which is actually the only, the only one of these nine countries in which that's the case. But there also are two bars here. There's a dark blue bar and a light blue bar, and that's the breakdown between men and women. And the other feature of these plots that you should notice is that the women are always doing better than the men in terms of their increase, their average increase in income over the course of those 20 years, and that's very interesting. So if you look at the US in particular, for example, you can see that men in the bottom half have lost money, and in the top half have gained money, but women have gained money across the board, and, uh, and women at the top, at the top, uh, in the top 10% have gained twice as much as men have gained. Now, this doesn't show us from what baseline, right? so we'll look at that with those data in just a moment. Here's, here's another, another data point about education. So this is, um, this is the US population, uh, 25 and older, and there, there are similar data available in, in Europe and in Asia as well. They tell much the same story. So um, education has been, has been rising, and that's also connected, of course, with the rise of technology. As you, as you have you know, more and more technology, you don't have to spend as much time on the farm or as much time doing menial labor. People have to become educated in order to enter the workforce. There's more value in education, and also people are concentrating in cities and, and moving out of the countryside. That's also this, this very, very large-scale secular trend. And so you see all of that happening. The amount of education increases dramatically. And in, uh, you know, around World War II, only, only maybe 10% of, of Americans went to college, and that was, that was a, very, a very elite thing. And now more than half of Americans go to college. Now, let's rescale the y-axis by income. So, we'll, we'll look only at 1979 to present, and rescale by, by weekly adjusted hundreds of billions of dollars. And what you see here is that people who go to college make a lot more money than people who don't go to college. And uh, if Bill Gates weren't in the, you know, in the, in the green category, then probably this would be even more dramatic. <laughs> so it's, um, although I, I think he actually does count as having gone to college, so he's probably still in the red. So um, 
college education, not only, not only does it enable you to make a lot more money, but, but because, because both the fraction is growing and the amount of money is growing, essentially the whole economy is controlled by people who have college educations. And, uh, and now let's look at the gender breakdown of, of, um, of who is getting college educations. This is the number of college-educated women and the number of college-educated men as a function of time since 1979 in the US. Similar numbers again internationally. So in the US at least, these crossed over in the, in the, in the 90s. And there are now many more women than men uh, in the US population with college educations. And um, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm an applied mathematician, I don't like to extrapolate, I prefer to interpolate, but these are beautiful straight lines. Like we can keep going with that line for a while. <coughs> And uh, you can get a little bit of a peek into the future with these curves if you look at, at, at graduation rates. So these are rates of graduation for different kinds of degrees in the US. And you can see that women are, getting, are, are graduating with, with more than 50% of the degrees in every degree category. The crossovers happen first in early degrees, like, like um, bachelor's degrees, and they happen later for PhDs and MDs and so on. So you know, there's this general pattern that the, the kind of lighter weight, to, you know, the stuff happens first and the heavier weight happens, this stuff happens later, but, but women have crossed over the 50% line everywhere. And, uh, and it looks like they're asymptoting around 60%. So uh, what that tells you is that, um, you know, if everybody's asymptoting at 60% graduation rate, then over time, as we go into the 2020s, 2030s, about 60% of the college-educated population in the US is going to be female. And that's a huge, right, 60% to 40% is three to two, so half again as many women college educated as men. That's a very, very dramatic difference, especially when you consider how much more money you make when you go to college. So uh, this is a very, a very busy plot. I'm gonna break it down now in a moment in a much more understandable way, but I wanted to put it up to, to prove to you that my fits to the data, which are in solid lines, are pretty good. All right, so the data are, are, are circles, uh, and the solid lines are my fits to the data. And what this is showing is how much money women are making as a fraction of men in the US from 1979 to 2012 for full-time employed women and men. All right, so now we're gonna step through the data. This is, this is what a 50-year-old woman makes relative to a 50-year-old man, both full-time employed. All right, so in 1979, it sucks to be a woman in the US because you're making 56% of what a man is making at the same age. But it gets better as, as, one, as one moves forward. Uh, we go to 2012, she's making more than 75% of what a 50-year-old man is making. Now let's look at younger women because there are two ways of looking into the future. One of them is to look forward in time and the other one is to look younger in age. So 49, 48, 47, and so on. I'm gonna scroll down to younger and younger women and we'll see the pattern. Right? It's pretty dramatic. Now, something interesting happens at, at age 21, which is that suddenly this craps out. <laughs> but um, that shouldn't surprise us, because ages 16 to 21 are the ages when, when people are in college. All right, so if, you, if you're in the full-time employed population in, during these ages, then you're in a bit of a special population. Generally, if, if, that, if you're female, then you're doing nannying and things like this, and if you're male, you're in construction work or heavy labor, and those are, those are actually uh, professions that don't, that don't have a tremendous amount of economic growth later on, and, uh, and are, are not, anyway, they're, they're not representative of what's, of what's going on in general. So if you, if you think about these, about these ages post-college, then you see this very, very dramatic shift, where where the amount of money that women are making when they're full-time employed is just rocketing upward. And um, so, you know, you have to wonder where this is going next. The, the most recent data on, online are, are, are from 2012, but, um, you know, is there a 90% glass ceiling? Probably not. You know, let's look at that, 20, that 25 to 34 critical, critical age group, the, the last one before we get into the college age stuff. You know, it just, it looks like it's just going up. Will it, uh, will it reach 100%? Will it go past 100%, right? I think it will. Um, I'll, I'll skip this. Um, this, is, this is some neoconservative stuff that, that is immaterial to the argument. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, even if we assume, I mean, this is very Mickey Mouse math, but even if you assume that that, that, that 90% um, 
glass ceiling is real, and that women only, you know, full-time employed women only make 90% of what full-time employed men make, the fact that, that the college populations dominate means that you're still talking about you know, 0.9 times 0.6 over 0.4, meaning that, men have a, or that, that women have 135% of the money that men have, basically, disposable income in the US. But if they reach 100% of what men have, then they have 150% of the money that men have. Now, I, I should be very clear that I'm, when, when I say they have 150% of the money, the great majority of the world's capital is still in the hands of men. Because when you look at the very, very top of the distribution, at the, at the top 1% of the 1%, then it's overwhelmingly male-dominated. On the other hand, that's not the consumer market. That doesn't reflect the realities of what most people are able to afford and do in the real world. So what this is showing us is that in terms of buying power and economic power, women are, are really poised to dominate men uh, in, the, in the coming decades. And it's very hard to overstate the importance of that. So I said yesterday, very hard to overstate the importance of machine, of machine intelligence coming. This one is also a really big one. Because I don't think that this has happened in 10,000 years. Right? So um, I, this, is, this, this story, I think, has gotten surprisingly little play. It's, it's gotten some. So, uh, you know, Hannah Rosen wrote this book called The End of Men, and she noticed some of the same things that, uh, that I've noticed here. Um, she has some, some arguments and some interesting things to say about why that, why that is. Um, I'm going to try speculating, too. Uh, this, is, this is at least one kind of speculation about what might be happening here. This has to do with... with um, uh, well, this, this argument is, is from a, a paper that argues that... that uh, services versus goods ratio in employment has a lot to do with this. I think there's something to be said for that. But I think there's something bigger going on and more obvious. And it has to do with this, this cycle that, that, that's the big picture that we've been talking about. And the rise of machine intelligence is only one piece of this. I mean, more generally, we're talking about technology uh, increasing, uh, economic growth continuing, rising education, urbanization, people moving into cities. And I have a feeling that all of those things combined, that cycle leads to, um, to a sort of differential um, fitness between, between men and women. <laughs> and um, the, the argument basically boils down to something that, that Steven Pinker said in, in this book, why, why Violence Has Declined, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, so Pinker's... Pinker's thesis in this book was, was that violence has declined uh, historically over, over many, many timescales, kind of no matter what timescale you choose to look at. Yes, there are big wars, there are big disasters, but, um, but generally speaking, as, as um, cities grow, as uh, the environment changes, so the emergence of strong governments and authorities with a monopoly on violence, the interconnectivity of cultures through the need for trade, increased literacy, urbanization, mobility, and so on, as those things happen, violence declines. And you can, you, can look at, you can look at the decline of violence in many, many ways. You can ask, for example, what, is, what are your odds of dying a violent death if you're born in 1800 relative to if you're born in 1900? What about if you're born in 1900 relative to 1950? What about 1950 relative to 1990? And you see your chances of dying a violent death going down and down and down and down. And, um, you know, the thing is that, that testosterone which is the main sex-determining hormone in, in, uh, in, in us and in most animals, uh, is not neutral with respect to, to properties like violent behavior. We know that. Um, I mean, this, this hormone is reasonably well understood. We know that men have much, much more of it than, than women. We know that it makes uh, men take more risks. We know that it makes them less generous, uh, more selfish. Uh, there's a beautiful experiment from, um, from 2009 in which male subjects are, um, are asked to play a game in which there are both competitive and cooperative modes of winning. So it's a sort of prisoner's dilemma type game. And you can modulate the level of testosterone in the blood and watch the gameplay shift from one mode into the other as you, as you shift the level of testosterone. It's very, very clear. Um, so you know, a lot of things we don't understand about, about, uh, about gender uh, a lot of things that are not true about gender, like differential ability in math and science, there's been no study that shows that there's any, any difference there once you get rid of stereotype bias. But, um, but on, on these points, I think it's actually very clear. And, and so what about, um, you know, what about 
selection bias for one kind of behavior or the other. Well, if you look, if you look at job wanted postings in newspapers from, say, 1962, all right, you find uh, phrases like job wanted aggressive men, uh, you know, salesmen wanted, you know, and so on. And, uh, you know, this is kind of the Mad Men, you know, pre, or slightly pre Mad Men era or something. And, um, you know, and then when you look at the Lethbridge Herald in 2011, it's, you know, a collaborative opportunity to join a collaborative team is building maintenance assistant, team-oriented leadership style, emphasizing collaborative decision-making, well-developed interpersonal skills, and so on and so forth. And, um, and you, can, you can kind of do little, you know, silly analyses. Like, I, I, so I, I used newspaperarchive.com to just run a little search on job-wanted collaborative and job-wanted aggressive. And you get curves like these. So red is job wanted aggressive, blue is job wanted collaborative. And we know, we know these things you know, uh, empirically, right? You know that, that words like collaborative or, or you know, good at working in groups or customer focused or you know, all these kinds of things, this, this is very of the mode now. Whereas uh, you know, aggressive, um, driven, and so on, you know, these, these, kinds of, these kinds of words, cowboys need not apply, right? Is kind of the classic sign in a city. Um, building front, right? You, you don't see that in, in the countryside. In the countryside, cowboys are fine, but not so much when they move into the city. So, um, so I think this is really just a function of working group size. You know, as, as, uh, as people concentrate into higher density environments and start to work in larger groups, and we see a lot of evidence of that happening. When you look at, for example, papers or patents published in cities, they have much larger numbers of authors. Than, than papers and patents published in, the, in, the, in, in lower density places, larger numbers of authors, and also higher productivity, because those in, the increasing number of collaborations and increasing density of, of stimuli mean that more happens in the cities than in the countryside, which, by the way, fuels that, that inequality that we were talking about earlier. So all these things are connected. As that happens, you select against um, all of the things that testosterone gives us men. You select against um, aggressiveness, and selfishness, and uh, you know all the positive things like strength and ruggedness and so on that are just fine if you're you know on horseback and you're being all Marlboro man in the country. So it's just not useful if you're trying to write a science paper with 20 other people, and you have to work well in groups. Right. So um, you know, as a sort of final final note, um, level of testosterone in men has been dropping dramatically over the last few decades. And there's a bunch of science on this now. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of people, I think, you know, well, there's been, there's been a lot of speculation about why this might be so. Like, maybe it's the plastics. You know, maybe it's BPA that has this feminizing effect on men or something. But, um, and, you know, I, I, I'm sure that plastics are bad. But um, I, I don't think that that's why testosterone level in men has been dropping the way it has. I think that it's like calluses. You know, you, you have them when you need them. And... Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence that, for example, over, over short time scales, if you're engaged in behaviors that, um, that are stressful in either positive or negative ways, you see short-term modulations in cortisol and testosterone level in the blood. And I'm sure that, I'm not sure, I hypothesize that over the, over the longer term, you see such modulations as well. If you're in an environment where the, you know, ruggedness and harshness, if you're a, a, you know, a warlord in Cameroon, then you, know, you probably have a high testosterone level. And, and that's, that's not only selected for, but also reinforced by the environment. And on the other hand, if you're, if you're trying to collaborate, if you're the, you know, the, like the, even if you're in a leadership position, if you're the, the dean of some, um, uh, you know, some academic department and you have to get a lot of different institutes to work together, so I, I don't think that these are, these, this is the kind of environment that selects or that reinforces for high testosterone. And I think that's why we see these kinds of declines. All right, so um, a, few, a few final sort of takeaway points. I don't think that, that this economic rise of women um, implies dominance over men. And I, I actually think that this is a very parallel argument to why I think that our thinking about Skynet is, is wrong. You know, when, when men especially think about the rise of machine intelligence, they think in terms of dominance hierarchies, which are a very male way of thinking. And so, you know, oh, robots are coming, well, you know, who's going to be on top? Like, who's got the bigger dick? You know, and, and, um, and that's, you know, that's, that's a fundamentally male way of thinking. That, the, that dominance hierarchy way of thinking is, is associated with testosterone level. And, um, you know, 
my, my point with machine intelligence is that that's only the case if we give the machine intelligence the cock and balls. You know, like if, if, we, if we supply it with, with, with some emotional feedback loop that you know, favors dominance or something, and we'd have to be idiots to program that in, right? Then, then, you know, then we'll, get, we'll get the expected behavior, but we don't have to do that. Nothing requires that we attach a cock and balls to our, to our machine intelligence. Right? So, so, you know, if, that's, if those are not the values that we imbue our machine intelligences with, if we imbue them with the values of, of selflessness, of generosity, of service, of attending and, you know, being empathic to, to, the, to the people around the intelligence, then, you know, then, then good things will happen. And, um, and similarly, I'm not, I'm not actually literally equating, you know, women with machines, but just to be clear. <laughs> but... But the fact is that, you know, it's not like, you know, women are going to rise up and then start to beat the shit out of all of the men and try to dominate them. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know if they, I mean, some of them will, I'm sure. <laughs> but but, um, but that's, that's, you know, that doesn't, it's not necessarily a dominance game. I mean, as, as these, these large shifts that we're talking about involve increases in collaboration and cooperativity and so on, it doesn't, that means we don't have to look at this thing in terms of one group dominating the other. You know, men have dominated women for 10,000 years. The next chapter of the story does not have to mean women dominating men for the next 10,000. You know, it might mean that we just are happier together. But um, many men, um, of course, don't think that way. You know, they, they're stuck in the dominance hierarchy way of thinking, and so they're very afraid. And I think that you know, even though some of the things that I've been talking about today are maybe news or maybe surprising you know, to many of us in the room, this kind of rise of women and so on, I, you know, I think at some level, Many men feel this happening. They feel the, the, um, the disempowerment or the lack of valuing of the things that, that, uh, that they traditionally bring to the table of the masculinity, and it makes them very afraid, and they're not going quietly. And I think that that polarization between, uh, between liberal and reactionary, uh, I think that the war on women, uh, I think that what's happening in, in Russia um, and what's happening in some African countries with, uh, with you know, death penalties for, uh, for homosexuality and all these kinds of things, I think that those things are all connected, that, that there's, there's this, this sense of reaction and of fear on the part of many men uh, to this change in, in, in the balance. And uh, maybe it's at some very instinctive level. I'm now completely speculating. But, um, but I, I think that that's led to some of those tensions. Um, maybe that's the latent variable in a lot of today's political discourse. Maybe it's about gender or about this, about this, uh, this shift in, in what is valued in society. And a lot of the other stuff on top is, is kind of at the phenomena. All right, so I, I guess I'll, I'll end there. I'm not sure if I've run over my time. <laughs>